Good morning, Canada. Good afternoon, Eurasia. And thank you everyone for joining us today, despite on such broad variety of time zones. As usual, when opening our first traditional event in January, I wish everyone a happy new year and welcome to our online session. My name is Tatiana Demlovskaya, for, for those who doesn't know me. I am the regional director of the Vancouver chapter of Canada Eurasia Russia Business Association. And I'm happy to announce that the 10th Vancouver International Mining Conference on the margins of AME BC Roundup is now open. The conference is kicking off a series of events compiling the Serba Eurasia Mining Program 2021 and includes webinars, B2B meetings, and other activities initiated to bring more cross-border connections between the resource sector professionals. Mm -hmm. The program will end on March 12th with our virtual Eurasian conference on the margins of PDAC mining show in Toronto. Today we celebrate our anniversary event that have been initiated by our distinguished member B2Gold in 2011 and successfully conducted for 10 consecutive years, uh, promoting advanced technologies, diversification of trade and sustainable industry. It was attended since by over 2000 participants from many Eurasian and other countries. And although today we are not able to shake hands and exchange business cards as we usually do, the modern technologies allowed us to bring on board much more people from Eurasia than ever before. And I wish everyone to benefit from this opportunity to connect, network, and build up further partnership. Uh, before we begin the program, I would like to express deep gratitude to sponsors and partners who made this event possible. The patron sponsor of this event is Kinross Gold. The gold sponsor is B2 Gold. The conference is supported by Global Affairs Canada within the CanExpert framework. Our long-term partner of this event is Association of Mineral Explorations BC. Now I'd like to make uh, um, a few household uh, comments uh, to make your participation comfortable and effective. The conference will have a few equally important parts. It consists of a short welcome session, two speaker panels, Q&A session, and closing remarks. For smooth conduction, all listeners will be muted. Those people who would like to participate at Q&A session, we ask to write your questions at the Q&A field. To open the field, please carry down the cursor to the bottom of your screen and click at Q&A button. We ask you to kindly specify speaker to whom your question will be addressed. The moderator will uh, read the question accordingly. Those questions that will not be answered because of the time restrictions, we respond by email after the conference. Uh, one of our presentations, it's a, a presentation two at panel one, will be performed in Russian language with consecutive English translation. To access interpretation, please use interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. To switch to the English language, you will need to clean the, click the button and choose the language when the selection pops up. You can try this right now and connect with us if there will be any problems. All uh, presentations shown uh, at the session will be available on our website. The video record of conference will be posted on YouTube and available for all conference participants and other interested parties. And now I would like to pass the stage to the conference moderator, His Excellency John Sloan, the former ambassador of Canada to Russia, Armenia, and Uzbekistan. In his extraordinary career, Mr. Sloan served at various positions at Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade in Canada and overseas, promoting uh, Canadian values and developing economic and trade relations at the highest intergovernmental level. 
John retired from diplomatic activity in 2013, and we are extremely lucky to having him involved with Serba as our advisor and friend. Full version of Mr. Sloan's bio you can find online at the conference brochure. And now, John, over to you. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, I'm pleased to again be moderating the Serba meeting on the margins of the AIM uh, conference in Vancouver, even if this year it's by Zoom. Uh, this meeting has a special uh, significance for me because as I said before, both my grandfathers were gold miners, one at Braylorn Pioneer in BC's Bridge River country, and the other ended his career as the chief mining engineer for Kaminko at Pine Point in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. But today we'll be looking at the Greater East Asia, an area of increased focus and competition. On the one hand, we have the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative aimed at establishing transportation and supply corridors between China and Europe, supported by the Asian Infrastructure Bank. And on the other, we have the Russian push for closer Eurasia Economic Union, which already includes Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. But just to complicate things, the recent election in Kyrgyzstan produced an overwhelming victory for the national Sadir uh, Japarov, who was jailed for kidnapping for a kidnapping related to his calls for the nationalization of the Canadian owned Kumtor gold mine, Kyrgyzstan's largest, national, uh, largest foreign investment. Equally, however, there are new regulations and new regulatory approaches in both Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. So there's lots to discuss, but first we will have a welcoming remark, uh, starting with Aaron Campbell, chairman of the uh, chairperson of the Vancouver chapter of Serba and Honorary Consul for the Russian Federation in British Columbia. Erin. Thank you so much, John. And uh, thank you to Tatiana and the rest of the Serba regional directors who have put together, I feel a, just an extraordinary panel for us today. This is an unusual conference for all of us. Um, in Vancouver, the, the conference that we do on the margins of Roundup has been one of our key events of the year. We, um, we usually gather together uh, and, uh, and, and spend time getting to know each other. And so we've, what uh, Tatiana and her team have done have, have tried the very best to replicate the, uh, the connections that we all enjoy um, at the conference. At, you know, this is our 10th conference um, on the margins of, uh, of Roundup, uh, AMBC Roundup. Many of you may not know this, but this conference was actually initiated by Roger Richet, who was Executive Vice President General Counsel at B2 Gold, and, and obviously first in, uh, in 2011. Um, I, I want to extend a special thanks to B2 Gold, who is um, one of our sponsors for the, the conference today, but uh, also for their ongoing commitment to Eurasia and Russia and their support of the association for the, for the, last, uh, the last 10 years. The uh, predecessor to B2 Gold was a company called Bima Gold. They had a long history of operating successfully in Russia in the early to mid 2000s, um, particularly around its renowned Julieta mine in the Far East and the Kupol mine in the Chukotka region of the Northeast of the country. Now with Uzbekistan being a world famous mining jurisdiction with an impressive history of gold production, potential is only growing for um, further world-class discoveries. And we're delighted to see B2 Gold back involved um, in, uh, in Eurasia, and particularly in Uzbekistan. Um, Mike, uh, Neil Reeder, who's the Vice President of Government Relations at B2 Gold, will be uh, joining us today on the second panel, and will be able to provide further um, background and advocacy for helping to promote, promote foreign trade and investment into, into this important region. On the, uh, on the welcome panel, we also have um, representatives from the federal and provincial governments of Canada and British Columbia. And I will now pass the baton over to um, to our next uh, our next panelist, uh, Paul Irwin from the government of British Columbia. Thank you, Paul. Well, thanks very much, Aaron, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to join the Serb of Vancouver International Mining Conference uh, once again this year in a virtual format. I bring greetings on behalf of the BC Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation, Ravi Kalon, 
as well as the Minister of State for Trade, George Chow, who I know has joined this event in previous years. Um, I want to give a, a, a special thanks to Serva and in particular to Tatiana for the excellent work you do in strengthening business ties between Canada, British Columbia, Russia, and Eur the Eurasia region. I know our focus today will be on mining opportunities in greater Eurasia, in Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Uzbekistan, and the Russian Federation. However, I do want to highlight that British Columbia is also rich in mineral resources and has over 150 years of mining history. Mining and mineral exploration is a vital part of the BC economy, it counts for about 15% of our economic base, and we produce a wide range of mining products including gold, copper, gold, um, malignum, silver, aggregates, and industrial minerals. Mineral exploration, mining, and related sectors employ about 30,000 people in our province and add about 12 billion to our economy each year. Vancouver is a global center for expertise for mineral exploration. We have over a thousand mining exploration services and supply companies headquartered here and British Columbia is looking to position itself as a global leader in responsible mining exploration and extraction with proven success in working with local communities, engaging with indigenous and first nations and prioritizing environmental responsibility. Uh, international trade is obviously a key uh, part of uh, driving British Columbia's economy and our jobs, particularly in the mining sector. And we're committed to helping our BC companies uh, to explore new international opportunities, including uh, in the greater Eurasia region. We're also committed to helping international companies that are looking to explore investment opportunities here in British Columbia, uh, including in the mining sector. BC has an international network of trade and investment representatives in Asia, Europe and the United States. And we also work closely with our federal uh, colleagues within the Canadian Trade Commissioner's Service elsewhere in the world. We are pleased to work with BC companies in supporting their export goals and also to work with any Eurasia companies who may be interested in investment opportunities here in British Columbia. So thanks again for this opportunity to make brief welcoming remarks and we look forward to an excellent program here today. Thank you, Paul. Um, our next uh, welcoming remarks are from the federal government, uh, Rene Umazaki, who is the director of the Vancouver Regional Office, uh, but also has served as a trade commissioner in Ottawa, Jakarta, and Tokyo. Rene. Thanks very much, John, and good morning, everybody. As uh, John introduced me, uh, my name is Rene Umazuki. I'm the director for the Vancouver Regional Office of Global Affairs Canada and the Trade Commissioner Service. And it's my great pleasure today to help open this conference with some brief words of welcome. And I'd also like to express my appreciation to Serba for the invitation and the opportunity to do so today. So for those of you unfamiliar, I, I'm not sure that there's many in the audience, but those of you who are unfamiliar with Global Affairs Canada and the Trade Commissioner Service, let me say just very briefly that we're the federal government department charged with promoting and protecting Canada's interests internationally. So the Trade Commissioner Service is the part of the department that promotes Canada's commercial interests. And we do this by assisting Canadian companies to expand internationally. We're a network of over a thousand trade professionals working around the world and here in Canada. We're actually um, present in over 160 cities worldwide and uh, six regional offices in Canada. And basically we, to put it simply, we provide information, resources, advice, connections, and assistance in troubleshoot, troubleshooting problems to Canadian companies to help them make better, faster decisions to avoid risk. And ultimately we're hoping to save them time and resources. We also provide funding to Canadian companies to help them de-risk their entry into new markets. And we participate in lots of events and missions like this one. And for example, also in March, we'll be, ho we'll be hosting a virtual Canada Pavilion at PDAC. And we're also leading a virtual mining and green mining mission to Mexico in March as well, in order to connect Canadian companies to international opportunities. 
One of our uh, key priorities is to encourage the diversification of Canada's trade into new markets. And of course, those of Eurasia and Central Asia represent uh, great opportunities in that regard. I'd like to touch very briefly on Canada's mining sector and specifically on a couple of aspects that I think set the sector apart internationally. As you all well know, Canada has been long recognized as a leader in mining uh, with extensive mineral deposits and expertise built on centuries of mining history. And I think Paul just touched upon some of these things as well. Um, Canada, but Canada is also a global leader in clean technologies, supporting the transition to a low carbon economy across all sectors, including playing a critical role in the mining sector's green transformation, whether that be providing renewable energy solutions, such as electrification of transportation fleets and equipment, technologies for energy storage and increasing energy efficiency, automation and big data solutions, or technologies related to water and wastewater treatment. In fact, within the, the clean uh, technology um, sector, water treatment is one of Canada's uh, core strengths. Canadian firms offer very innovative water applications and technologies that can serve limited water supplies that treat and reuse effluent within operations and recover waste, or sorry, recover value from wastewater streams. These strengths are positioning Canada as the global leader in green mining technologies and practices and can help mining operations not only achieve their environmental sustainability goals, but also can impact very positively on their bottom line. A second area I think that distinguishes Canada's extractive sector in particular, and again, Paul touched a little bit on this, is the area of responsible business conduct. Uh, responsible business conduct is really at the nexus of many priorities for Canada, such as the respect for human rights, fighting climate change, inclusive trade, and respecting the rights of Indigenous communities. But from a commercial perspective, we also recognize that managing risks in complex markets is key to business success. By incorporating responsible business contact, conduct into their operations, companies are really better equipped to manage social, environmental, um, reputational, and, and economic risks. We're committed to advancing the responsible business practices of Canadian companies in markets around the world. And to that end, we're just in the process right now of, of renewing our responsible business conduct strategy. So this, uh, I think, is another core strength of the Canadian mining sector. So uh, whether you represent a Canadian company looking to expand or a mining sector player looking for a Canadian partner, I invite you uh, today to connect with uh, the Trade Commissioner Service. Please reach out to us in Vancouver or across Canada. We have six regional offices or to my colleagues located on the ground in markets around the world. And I think a few of them are uh, joining us today. We're here to help bridge the distance between Canada and international markets. So with that, I wish you an informative and productive um, event. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Renee. And our final uh, welcoming remarks come from Kendra Johnson, the president and CEO of AIM, uh, the Association of Mineral Exploration BC. And I would note that Kendra is a professional geologist uh, and uh, has uh, over 15 years of mining experience in uh, various aspects of uh, mineral exploration. Kendra. Great, thank you so much, John. Uh, I'd like to start today by recognizing that uh, Roundup and the Cerber Conference today are coming to you from the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, and we thank them for uh, letting us use their territory uh, and welcoming us to their territory. Uh, it is once again uh, an incredible honor to be invited to take part in Serba and to welcome all of you, uh, not only to your conference today, but also to the Roundup Conference, uh, which of course is virtual this year. Uh, AME is the lead advocacy association for the mineral exploration industry in British Columbia. It is our mission to uh, promote and protect the interests of mineral explorers right across the province or those who are working here in British Columbia uh, or who are based here in British Columbia but working elsewhere. So 
Um, that is what we do. We also, of course, host uh, the largest technical mineral exploration conference known as Roundup. This year, as you can see in my background, it is Remote Roundup, uh, and it's kicking off in about half an hour. Uh, the conference this year, of course, is virtual. It's also open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the next six months. The conference is only a week, but all of that material is going to be available on demand. So uh, we do uh, definitely invite you to come and take part if you would like to. Um, it is a, a great conference. I know many of you have been in the past and I know that many of you have already registered. I have seen your names on the list. So thank you for that. We appreciate the support. Uh, we have lots of fantastic things going on here in British Columbia that we look forward to sharing with you and lots of great investment uh, possibilities as well. So uh, I wish you the best for your conference here. And I, uh, I thank Serba, uh, Tatiana and, and her team uh, for the opportunity to welcome you all and wish you uh, a wonderful day today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kendra. Um, as we move into panel number one, I would note that we're probably about 10 minutes behind. So I would encourage all panelists to be as concise and as brief as possible. Uh, we will open panel number one with a keynote speech from the Honorable Stockwell Day um, who uh, was Canada's leader of the official opposition uh, and in his um, uh, ministerial portfolios, uh, amongst others, was the Minister of International Trade, the Minister for Asia Pacific, and the President of the Treasury Board. Uh, Mr. Day is going to talk about mining for good, and I will turn it over to him. Stockwell. Well, thanks so much, John. I'm very encouraged to hear already as, as the uh, conference has uh, launched officially, what uh, an amazing array of individuals we have representing companies, but also, uh, in fact, governments in this very important relationship we have between Canada, Eurasia, Russia, and, and all of the business and mining connections, especially. So I wanna just uh, look briefly, we're, we're sort of breaking into uh, four areas here quickly. Um, you know, we reflect on what's been going on in this last year, and people can rightly say, you know, what's been good about 2020, <laughs> and what can possibly be good about 2021. The, uh, the upside of the downside is really, and this has happened, happened in the mining sector for sure, but happens broadly across all sectors. When we go through a phenomenally incredible time on the business side, and this includes our mining sector, what happens with the unfortunate uh, kick in of uh, things like layoffs and reduction in employment. Individual companies, in fact, government operations also look to efficiencies. And it's where you see some real breakthroughs in terms of not just processes, but products. And in fact, in this year, it's been recorded in a number of uh, various business uh, journaling and, and business assessments, most operations, we're looking at mining now, as you look at efficiencies, have developed new processes for development of their own products. And coming out of 2020, what you have is a more efficient sector and also one that because you become more efficient, you actually have slightly higher and improved margins coming into a time of increased demand. And the other thing to be aware of, anytime there's been a significant global downtime, usually the two sectors, the development the, the, or the sector of developed economies, and then the other sector of emerging economies, coming out of a downtime, it's usually one or two of those particular broad sectors that in fact experiences an increase in growth. But this time, and it has not happened that many times over the last 40 years, you have the developed economies and the emerging economies coming through with projected growth in demand simultaneously. That's going to provide not just an undergirding, but in fact, uh, an enhancement of the capabilities because you've got the developed and the emerging economies globally coming into a time of increased demand. So then let's look at, um, you know, that all the focus has been on what has gone down in terms of all the economic indicators over 2020. And we used to say in the good times, there used to be a caution out there, what goes up has to come down. So we're in the enviable position here, ironically, of looking at things that have gone down actually have to come back up. 
And so when you do a survey of global demand pr projections and then tie that in with GDP pr projections, especially for the reason, region that Serva serves, we see some very positive indicators. I mean, you can look at, and, and, and you know, we're scanning uh, uh, the variety of, of projection and projecting um, organizations around the world. The consensus seems to be, for instance, look at uh, Kazakhstan with uh, GDP projections of over 3%. Uh, Mongolia, and we're gonna be hearing uh, just uh, shortly from a great representative from Mongolia, uh, GDP projections upwards of 6.7%. Uzbekistan, looking at 4.8 to 5% GDP projected increase. These are very positive signs. Georgia, 4.9 to 5%. So when you look at those in, in the companies, in the countries in which we're all partners now, uh, in this uh, great organization that Serva serves. Now, we, we look, go a little broader, China, over 8% GDP growth. India, 8.3% growth. When you see growth at that level on economies of that magnitude, that means there's going to be significant demand for the types of products, especially in the mining industry, that are necessary and needed and can be provided by the Serba region and by the combined effects of companies that have worked together in uh, Canada, Eurasia, Russia, and through that whole business community. So a very positive time in terms of looking at what has gone down is now moving up. And so what does that actually mean for us? What does it mean for Canada? What does it mean for Eurasia? Uh, what does it mean for companies that have worked together in the past? With the increased demand, there of course is gonna be increased partnership. We're seeing that already this year with investments, Canadian companies uh, in, in investing, for instance, in Mongolia increased there. We're looking at projections in, in uh, Kazakhstan that are very positive. And uh, along with some of the challenges, which John has quite rightly mentioned, and we have to be considerate to do that, we see the opportunity of improvements. Now, along with the downturn that we've gone through in, in 2020, what we've seen, intergovernmentally between our different countries represented by Serba is the ongoing improvement in the investment agreements, trade agreements, foreign protection agreements. This has been an ongoing work. Significant credit has to go to the trade offices and trade commissions of which uh, I was certainly always excited to be a part of as minister. And businesses will tell you in all of these countries, Canada and in the Eurasian community, these commissioners do have a sense of what is going on on the ground and can be of incredible help in terms of linking together for the possibilities that are ahead. So what does that mean? You know, people have looked at and sometimes there are concerns raised related to the resource industry, but the improvements again, and we have to tout these as industry representatives, as companies and as countries, we need to talk about the increased and improved areas in terms of uh, mining and resource development that mean less impact, lower emissions, and less impact globally while leading to improvements in standard of life. And these new and innovative processes are, are, are going to go a long way. You're going to be seeing things in 2021 as a result of these relationships that have a tremendously um, uh, improved effect on the global impact overall. So we've got the combined effect of growth We've got increased demand. When you look at breakthrough technologies, even in the hydrogen in industry, for instance, and the way the past that we have in terms of Serba countries working together, I think it's positive. I sense it strongly. We have a, an incredible year ahead for 2021, and it's based on some of the helpful developments that occur in organizations like this. I'm looking forward to what's ahead for 2021. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stockwell, for that uh, uplifting presentation. Um, our second speaker in panel one is uh, Mr. Talgat uh, Satiev, the chairman of the Kazakhstan Geology Committee at the Ministry of Ecology, Geology, and Natural Resources. He has spent his entire career uh, on government postings related to national resource management and regulations. Um, as Tatiana mentioned, uh, Mr. Satiev is going to be speaking in Russian 
So if everybody could uh, click their interpretation button, uh, if you wish to have uh, an English language interpretation. Um, Mr. Satiev, please. Thank you. Уважаемые коллеги, разрешите поприветствовать вас от имени Комитета геологии Министерства экологии и геологии природных ресурсов Республики Казахстан. Прошу следующий слайд. Минеральная сырьевая база нашей страны сформирована месторождениями топливно-энергетического комплекса к которым отнесены углеводороды, уголь, уран, а также черных, цветных, благородных, редких металлов, неметаллических полезных ископаемых, а также подземных вод. Государственный учет ведется по 113 видам полезных ископаемых. И государственным баллапсом учитывается более 8 тысяч месторождений. В том числе... По углеводородам 317, твердых полезных ископаемых 910, общераспространенных полезных ископаемых более 3000 и около 4000 месторождений подземных вод. Более 90% запасов приоритетных видов полезных ископаемых вовлечено в эксплуатацию. Следующий слайд. Несмотря на большое количество разрабатываемых в настоящее время месторождений, по мнению экспертов, недра Казахстана располагают все еще достаточно большим потенциалом для новых открытий. Геологами выделяется 15 осадочных нефтегазовых бассейнов с прогнозными ресурсами условного топлива порядка 76 миллиардов тонн. Степень изученности осадочных бассейнов разная. Из них 5 находятся в освоении, 5 малоизученные, и 5 мы пока относим к малоперспективным. На территории 5 освоенных бассейнов, это Прикаспийский, Устюрк, Бозашинский, Мангашлавский, Южно-Тургайский и Затанский, на карте не отмечены зеленым цветом. Необходимы исследования на более глубоких горизонтах. Территорию пяти малоизученных бассейнов планируется изучить за счет средств государственного бюджета. Следующий слайд, пожалуйста. По оценкам ученых, при Каспийском нефтяном бассейне еще не изученных бурением более глубоко залегающих горизонтов сосредоточено до 40 миллиардов тонн прогнозных ресурсов углеводородов. Нефтегазоносность при Каспийской впадине связана с двумя крупными осадочными мегакомплексами, поцелевым и нацелевым. С целью изучения глубинного строения при Каспийского бассейна для для выявления перспективных объектов на больших глубинах и, и оценки ресурсов в настоящее время нашим министерством ведется работу по проекту Евразия. Реализация проекта позволит получить достоверную геолого-геофизическую информацию о нефтегазоносном потенциале Падины, привлечь инвестиции в геологоразведочные работы. а также обеспечить разработку и внедрение высокоэффективных технологий в области разведки и освоения месторождений. Мы планируем проект осуществить тремя фазами. На первой фазе мы хотим провести переобработку, переинтерпретацию исторических данных региональных сейсмических профилей. Вторая фаза – отработка новых региональных 2D сейсморазведочных профилей в объеме более 8 тысяч погонных километров на перспективных участках, выделенных по результатам первой фазы.
Процесс, третья фаза – это процесс подготовки к бурению. И бурение с глубокой поисковой скважины на основе партнерства с международными нефтегазовыми и сервисными компаниями. Как вы знаете, глубина скважины предусматривается до 15 километров. В части твердых полезных ископаемых. Следующий слайд, пожалуйста. В части твердых полезных ископаемых. Крупными перспективными на золотородные месторождения располагает треть площади Костанайской области. Большая территория между Центральным и Восточным Казахстаном, а также юг Казахстана, прилегающего к Киргизстану. Новые свинцово-цинковые месторождения могут быть открыты в Центральном и Южном Казахстане, на Рудном Алтае, а также в приграничных площадях с Россией и Китаем. Потенциал основных видов полезных ископаемых свидетельствует, что общие запасы богатств недрах в несколько раз выше, чем мы сегодня имеем, и подтверждает необходимость проведения дальнейшего геологического изучения недр с использованием передовых технологий мирового уровня. Следующий слайд, пожалуйста. В этой связи по поручению главы государства Нами разработана и в ближайшее время будет утверждена государственная программа геологической разведки Республики Казахстан на 2021-2025 годы. Основная цель госпрограммы – повышение геологической изученности территории Республики Казахстан для обеспечения стабильного развития геологоразведки и восполнения минеральной сырьевой базы. В рамках госпрограммы предусматривается определить нефтегазовый потенциал слабо изученных осадочных бассейнов и изучение глубоких горизонтов в пределах горнорудных районов. Госпрограмма будет реализована как за счет госбюджета, так и частных инвестиций. Все мы знаем, что инвесторы заинтересованы в предварительно изученных объектах. Для этого государство финансирует проведение ранних стадий геологического изучения недр, что позволит повысить инвестиционный потенциал выставляемых участков с последующей передачей в недропользование. Следующий слайд, пожалуйста. Также в рамках государственной программы «Цифровой Казахстан» реализуется проект по созданию и внедрению информационной системы Национальный банк данных минеральных ресурсов Республики Казахстан. Система позволит собрать в единой базе геологические отчеты, балансы запасов полезных ископаемых, паспорта месторождений, Данные по изученности территории и иную геологическую информацию. Перевод можно, пожалуйста? Мистер Талгат, Талгат, мистер Сатиев, просьба чуть-чуть побыстрее и подвести итоги. Господин Слон попросил вас немножко завершать уже вашу презентацию, Хорошо, спасибо. господин Сатиев. Спасибо, спасибо, коллеги, прошу прощения. В общем, если вкратце говорить, в настоящее время у нас большой, если говорить простым языком, у нас на сегодняшний день большая работа проведена по повышению инвестиционной привлекательности. Это и законодательные у нас реформы проведены, которые основаны на лучшем передовом опыте. Также идет активная у нас 
автоматизация всех бизнес-процессов, связанных с недропользованием. Мы переходим на международные стандарты оценки запасов и многое-многое другое. Уважаемые коллеги, мы готовы к активному сотрудничеству с вами, готовы рассмотреть отдельные проекты, оказать полную поддержку. Наше министерство готово вам оказать полную поддержку в реализации ваших планов в нашей стране. Добро пожаловать, спасибо за внимание, особое спасибо переводчику. Thank you, Mr. Satyev. Uh, very interesting presentation and the slides will be available. Um, I note that we are following uh, a little further behind. So I'm going to push all our presenters to keep to the eight minute um, uh, time limit. And our next presentation is uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Yadma Arimbold, the ambassador of Mongolia to Canada. I note that Mr. Uh, Yarimbold has served in India, Japan, uh, China, Hong Kong, and Macau, and is now uh, from uh, 2018 um, um, Mongolia's ambassador to Canada. Uh, Mr. Uh, Yarambol, please. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, my fellow Mongolians participating uh, from different time zones. I would like to thank Serbia's Vancouver chapter and Association of Mineral Exploration of PC for organizing this. His research. Excellency, I'm sorry, we did not, uh, we don't hear you. Can uh, you double check your microphone, please? I'm hearing him, uh, uh, Tatiana. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I will get closer to my uh, mic uh, now, probably it will be easier. Do you hear me now? Okay, good morning, everybody. And uh, please accept my sincere thanks uh, to everybody organizing this uh, uh, Vancouver chapter. I could not, I, I could not listen. Okay, what about now? Uh, if you have any problems, uh, please uh, tell me now. And uh, if, as long as just John is able to listen to me, just uh, yep, to I hear you. Me, I, I, I keep going on. And- uh, I can hear also. Yeah. May, uh, may I offer a suggestion? I think people have not changed back from interpretation. I had the same problem. I changed it back. Now I can hear. So if others can do that, they can probably hear. Oh, very good. There was <laughs> some technical issue as usual. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, always just to believe there's uh, kinds of events will serve as an important platform for uh, strong post COVID-19 global economic recovery. It's my third time to speak at mining conference organized by Serba and my first time doing it virtually. So first time having this uh, technical issues, which is uh, thankfully settled off. I would like to take this opportunity to inform you that uh, the Deputy Minister of Mining and Heavy Industry of Mongolia, Mr. Batnarimdov has sent congratulatory message to Madame Kenda Johnston, President and CEO of AMI, wishing her a very successful event Roundup 2021. I am planning to get the Deputy Minister in person to feature AME Roundups and also Serba events. Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry of Mongolia kindly sent to us the presentation from the Geological Policy Department. And the link of this presentation will be provided at the end of my remarks. Amid the pandemic of, uh, amid the pandemic, Mongolia successfully held parliamentary elections last June, and this current government was formed as a result of this election. So the cabinet with ambition, uh, new goals to set up in its action plan. Uh, new action plan aims to develop responsible mining, processing of minerals, and increase of mineral reserves through more geological surveys, among the others. <clears throat> The government also aims to start construction of infrastructure to support the oil refining, chemical industry, as well as the processing of such resources as copper and iron. The government of Mongolia attaches high importance to the development of infrastructure that will bolster exploration of new deposits, as well as increase the export of minerals in the southern region of Mongolia, just next to Do, 
the world's second largest economy, China. There are two new railways under construction in this region. First is a 267 kilometers of the railway that will connect the cooking coal mine Taun Tolva, five yell in English, with the Chinese market at Mongolia China border checkpoint Kashun Suhait. This railway will tremendously increase the volume of mineral exports, decrease transportation costs, and will contribute to the protection of fragile ecosystems of the region. Another 414 kilometers of the horizontal line of the railway from town Tolve to Zumbayan goes through the areas endowed with promising discoveries. Construction of these railways being financed by state-owned mining companies and expected to be operational from 2022. The government of Mongolia is also committed to building a 450 megawatt coal-fired power station in this region with the pure purpose to provide uh, sustainable electricity to major mining companies operating in this area. Certain sections of the Asian action plan include also activities directed to the further development of the oil industry of Mongolia. Mongolia launched the construction of its first oil refinery, recently the long-awaited project that is funded by the Southland from India. The refinery will be small by international standards, processing 1.5 million tons of crude oil per year. Still, Mongolia as a new refinery will meet the nation's demand for gasoline, diesel, aviation fuel, and the liquefied petroleum gas. And oil pipeline to deliver the crude oil to the refinery is also to be constructed simultaneously. The government will facilitate the issuance of exploration licenses and uh, fund the more geological surveys aimed at increasing the minerals reserves in the country. I am very happy to note that, that some of Mongolian geological uh, consultancy companies that participated in a Sierra Vancouver's mining conference last year successfully established a cooperation basis with the Canadian companies that use artificial intelligence, machine learning, and geological surveys in the mining industry. I'm also very happy to know that uh, Max Group will present the gold deposit project in the second panel. Several other TSX listed Canadian companies are developing their projects in Mongolia. As an example, Erdin Resource Development Corporation announced last November that it has executed a mandate letter with Export Development Canada for an amount uh, for US dollars, 55 million senior security debt facility to develop the Bayunghundi Gold project in southern region of Mongolia. EDC's financing for the project is conditional upon the satisfactory completion of due diligence, which is currently is underway and expected to be concluded in the second quarter of 2021. Mongolia Canada cooperation in the mining sector has been bolstered by the cross listing of TSX listed companies shares in the Mongolian stock exchanges. By the way, uh, today we're celebrating 30th anniversary of establishment of Mongolian stock exchange in Mongolia. In June 2018, uh, Edino Source Development Corporation launched a secondary listing of its uh, common shares on the Mongolian stock exchange and closed the associate offering uh, 4 million common shares to Mongolian uh, residents. Another TSX listed gold miner, Step Gold Limited, has recently announced plans to list its shares on the Mongolian stock exchanges in April 2021. Uh, this listing will allow the more Mongolian investors to participate in the company's success. Canada is the, Canada is the top investor uh, in the mining sector of Mongolia. One of the world's the largest copper gold deposit of Mongolia was uh, discovered by a junior Canadian exploration company and it is now being developed into a multi-billion dollar world-class mine. Through its development assistance, Canada also supports Mongolia's efforts to develop a professional, merit-based and non-partisan civil service that can plan, administer, government reforms and initiatives. It also supports efforts to improve the quality, stability and transparency of Mongolia's mining-related legislation, policies and regulations. Therefore, we will continue actively displaying our policies and projects on such important platforms as Service Mining Conference, AMU Roundup, and PDAC. I hope that pretty soon we will be able to resume our international travels that will enable in-person discussion of professionals. In the meantime, our embassy is ready to receive questions or inquiry uh, proposal, and we will be very 
humbly honored to forward it to the relevant ministries and companies. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And again, I would like just to emphasize the Ministry of Mining uh, presentation link will be provided uh, from the server's point. Yes, please note that link will give us, give you the more uh, detailed information about Mongolian current ongoing policies. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Yerimbo, for that uh, very useful review and concise review of, of Canada Mongolian. Uh, relations in, in mining and, and uh, mineral exploration. Um, our next speaker is uh, Valery Maximov, uh, head of the Russian trade mission to Canada. Uh, I note that uh, Valery has spent most of his career with the government of the Republic of Saka, uh, Yakutia, uh, in Yakutsk. Uh, I know that the one of the uh, major Canadian uh, investments in Russia is the Silver Bear Silver Mine in uh, Yakutia and uh, along with uh, Kinross's investments in Chukoka is one of Canada's largest investments in Russia. Um, uh, Valerie is going to talk about uh, new and regional mining sector in the Russian Far East, uh, an area that he is extremely uh, uh, knowledgeable of. So Valerie, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, good morning, Canada, and good evening, Russia, and all participants from uh, Eurasia. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is our first Serbo conference uh, in 2021. I hope this year will be the less stressful and more predictable. I am delighted that something stays strong, and today's meeting proves it. Serbia Vancouver Mining Conference appeared to be a robust international platform that brought together experts and professionals to share the ideas and contribute, contribute mutual development in mining. Uh, I'm pleased to say thank you to all Canada, Eurasia Russia Business Association members and the Russian Canada and Russian Canadian Business Council for this organiza conference organization. It is always a pleasure to see business representatives who keep interested in developing business relations with Russia. Let me say a couple of words about um, uh, current economic conditions in, in Russia. The COVID-19 pandemic has plunged the global economy into the deepest recession since World War II, despite the substantial policy support global GDP in 2020 is projected to contract by 2.4%, followed by a recovery for 4.2% in 2021. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, during the cri uh, crisis, Russia's economy typically exhibit, exhibited more significant declines in economic activity on the back of the added effects of capital outflows and lower oil prices. During this crisis here, however, Russia's GDP decline was broadly in line with the global trends, which was due in part to the relatively greater emphasis placed in economic policy on securing macroeconomic stability and building sufficient reserves ahead of the crisis. A relatively low share of services and small businesses in GDP and a more significant role of the industrial sector also played a role in limiting the decline compared to the economies with a primary concentration in services and SME segment. What we used to think of a post-industrial world's weakness has become a support point for the Russian economy during the pandemic. Indeed, Russia's anti-crisis effort in 2020 was different from previous such undertakings in 2008-2009. In particular, the social sphere received a significant part of the support through subsidized loans and higher social transfers. There was more concerted effort this time around to elevate potential growth by extending support to sectors that are linked with the development of Russia's human capital, including healthcare, education, and IT. 
there are also significant attention accorded to supporting those sectors of the economy that accounted for an unpreciable share of employment. I should also mention that Russia's mining sector was declared essential and could continue operations during the pandemic. Each company had to implement safety measures in all operating sites. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, the key drivers affecting Russia's economic, economic performance in the near term uh, will be the pace of global economic recovery and the concomitant growth in oil and gas prices. According to the World Bank assessments, all in all, while the year 2020 presented a major challenge to the Russian economy, it's ex ante preparedness to external shocks served to attenuate the adverse effects of the global economic showdown, slowdown. While near-term recovery will be contingent on the stemming of the pandemic, longer-term economic prospects will depend on boosting potential growth. According to the uh, OECD, the world pandemic will affect most of the countries till 2022. Almost all G7 countries will be in the red zone due to a significant decline in 2020. Most developing G20 countries will have a slight surplus, except China, with a rocketing 15.3 growth in three years. Next slide, please. Russia's Economic Development Ministry has upgraded its 2020 GDP contraction outlook to 3.8 from 3.9 projected earlier. According to the ministry projections provided, Russia's GDP in 2021 is expected to grow by 3 to 0.3%. The forecast for 2021 is a bit higher comparing to OECD and World Bank assessments. Next slide, please. According to the BBC analysis, the top 20 mining companies are so far weathering the COVID-19 storm mostly unsketched and certainly better than many other sectors. Gold mining was at the top of the gainers among all mining sectors due to commodity price growth among 20 uh, world gold miners. Russian police become a leader in terms of the market capitalization change index. Next slide, please. Uh, if we are looking through the top 20 Russian companies with the best stock investment returns for investors, we can find gold mining companies in the top three positions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On the regional level, uh, Far Eastern Federal District regions looks not bad in terms of the mining production index. We even can find some regions in the green zone with a double digit surplus at the end of 2020. Next, please. Far Eastern Federal District of the Russian Federation is a world well-known vault of natural resources. I think all elements of the Mendeleev's periodic table are available here. Next, please. And Centers of Economic Development covers all the territory of the far east of Russia, from the south to the Arctic, from the east to the west. Next, please. The junior mining sector also developing in Russia, and you can see that most of them are situated in the far east of Russia. In 2020, we had for the first time the national booth during the PDAC convention in Toronto. Junior mining sector development was at the top of the agenda during working group meetings. We are very grateful for Serba and its Toronto chapter for the tremendous work that has been done to make it come true. Next, please. We have uh, foreign investors from different countries in the far eastern federal district regions, and Canada remains, remains a very important partner, and we are glad to admit that we could strengthen the economic ties between du uh, during uh, 2020. Next, please. I'm very glad to announce that three far eastern projects were awarded a Russian Mining Excellence Award during the last Minex Forum in October 2020. 
the Sapo Limital International, uh, Kinross Gold Corporation, and Highland Gold Mining. And uh, next, please. Uh, no, previous, sorry. And uh, uh, today I'm pleased to congratulate Kinross with uh, Investment Project of the Year Award. The project was recognized as a significant development that promotes uh, the Russian gold mining industry as an attractive investment destination. Next, please. Uh, with the many miners, some for the first time are experiencing the downside of global supply chains ultra lean operations and specialization. But the pandemic also highlighting the sector's resilience and the role that miners play in supporting communities and the broader economy. The Arctic Connect subsea cable is a Finnish plan to link Europe and Asia through a submarine communication cable on the seabed along the Northern Sea Route. This is an initiative of the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications and implemented by Finnish state-owned infrastructure operator Senior in collaboration with Russian telecommunication giant Megaphone and Russian Ross Geology Company, uh, which is well known for the oil mining companies in Russia. The total length of the Arctic Connect subsea cable will be 13,800 kilometers. The Arctic Connect subsea cable project is expected to be finished between 2022 and 2023. Next uh, Mr. Slide. Maximov, could you sum up, please? Uh, yes, I'm finishing. The Thank Siberian you. city of Norilsk may soon be the famous for a different type of mining. It's now host for the Arctic first crypto farm for producing new Bitcoins. Bit cluster is a facility Russian. Um, uh, Bit cluster is already planning an expansion after starting operation last year. And uh, uh, the data center's capacity is already being contracted and it will serve clients from all over the world, including Switzerland, United States and Japan. All those projects are win-win for both local communities and mining companies. The global pandemic has shown that automatization and digital operations can do more than reduce costs and drive efficiencies. Miners operating remotely or autonomously have found that technology also helps to manage the risks and impacts of COVID-19. They can be better supports remote workforces, reduce on-site presence, and monitor and control operations from outside of mine site settings. I hope we will be able to expand the Russian-Canadian economic dialogue to ensure beneficial cooperation for both countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Maximov. Um, I note that we are, are basically only one panelist behind um, and our final panelist in, in panel one is Mr. Azam uh, Kader uh, Hodzaev, who is deputy chair of the State Committee of Geology of the Republic of Uzbekistan. And he has particular responsibility for the maintenance of an active investment policy. Uh, Mr. Kader Hodzaev. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Can you? Yes. Can you hear me? It's okay? Yes. That's fine. Uh, first of all, let me appreciate the organizers for this event uh, within this new form of interaction. Uh, we should clearly understand, despite the tough times, we need to go on with our main goals. So let me once again greet you on behalf of State Committee on Geology and briefly tell you about uh, our activities, the mineral resource base, and the prospects for implementation of investment projects. Next slide, please. So we are the state regulatory body that implements a unified policy in the field of geological exploration, use protection of subsoils and we carry out geological exploration and reveal mineral deposits throughout the countries 
throughout the, the territory of the Uzbekistan and all geological information also gathered in our hand. Next slide, please. So Uzbekistan is among the top 10 leaders in the world of in the world in terms of reserves and resources of some of the most important types of minerals such as gold, uranium, copper, potash, phosphorites and other minerals. In addition, the country occupies a leading position in the in the world in terms of gold and uranium production itself and it should be noted that the country's territory has been explored only by 40 percent thus there is a there is a huge and yet to be discovered potential of the country next slide please according to the state balance more than more than 2200 deposits have been discovered in uzbekistan including uh, more than 800 construction materials uh, two, more than 200 hydrocarbons, about 150 metals and other prospective mineral resources. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to improve the investment climate, uh, we launched a cooperation uh, with international consultants such as uh, Boston Consulting Group. So BCG, together with BCG, we have uh, developed the strategy for the development of mineral resource base of Uzbekistan with the acceleration of attraction of foreign investment. Uh, we also worked out the criteria and the requirements for investors. We made roadmaps for implementation of modern international practices and methods to improve the regulatory framework of the country. We also launched together with BCG targeted investment process. At the same time, next slide, please. Uh, within the recommendations of Boston Consulting Group, uh, IMF, the royalties for base metals in, in the country have, has been reduced significantly uh, towards the international practice. For example, the gold, silver, copper, and other base metals reduced up to 10 percent uh, so the total tax burden in the connection with uh, corporate tax now is about 14 15 percent next slide please uh, yeah also the license fees for exploration was reduced up to 10 times uh, this is mostly uh, one-time fixed payments. Here in the slide, you can see the range of a reduction for, for, for this tax type significantly by, by the several metals. Uh, as a result, next slide, please. Uh, investment projects have been launched uh, with certain highly qualified companies uh, here I can say that uh, we will launch projects for exploration with, uh, with the companies Orana France uh, with the total co cost of exploration for uranium more than 20 million USD. We launched exploration projects with uh, B2 Gold Canada uh, with, with more than 10 million uh, USD per year. Uh, we also launched exploration project with uh, Japanese JOGMEC, uh, with Turkish Geological Survey, Russian and Korean companies, uh, with the projects worth about 80 million uh, US dollars. Moreover, uh, new launching investment agreements uh, with a totaling of more than 300 million US dollars. So in order to improve, in order to further improve, next slide, please. In order to further improve the procedures for issuing licenses, a transparent mechanism was approved based on the uh, public auctions. Uh, so we posted uh, on the e-platform investment proposals with the teasers and presentations. Uh, the first round of 
auction meetings. This is electronic auction meetings organized in November 2020 uh, with certain success. And the next auction meetings uh, we plan to organize in, in this coming February, February 2021. Potential, uh, next slide, please. So, so the main idea is to attract investors with 100% investor share. Uh, and the, the government uh, takes mostly with the taxes, it's taxes themselves. It's royalties and other uh, main taxes. Next slide, please. So uh, to go on forward with to go on forward, we made homeworks also with EBRD World Bank uh, concerning the new version of mining code. So we introduced our government, our cabinet, uh, the new mining code, uh, and the main points uh, here in this code are uh, transition to the new international standards with implementation, high implementation of JOR code, uh, the introduction of block systems uh, for the allocation of areas for geological exploration, which is, uh, we understand, is effectively used in Canada, Australia, in Kazakhstan mining code. Uh, another one is implementation of minimal exploration obligations uh, within the licenses under first come first serve principle and other best international practices. Next slide. So in, in conclusion, uh, let me feature out some few, some uh, key points. So having in one hand uh, the favorable investment climate, a stable investment legal base, support from the government and another in another hand a qualified local personnel with a relatively low cost of workforce and energy resources and of course the rich mineral potential makes uzbekistan a very favorable destination for investments uh, this is the end to my presentations thank you all for your Attention. Thank you, Mr. Kadyohodzaev. That was a very interesting presentation. And that concludes our, our first panel. Uh, I would note that we are uh, 15 minutes behind, which I think is not too bad, uh, given that we had five speakers. We have another five speakers on our second panel. Uh, and basically, uh, you've got half an hour to fit five speakers in. Um, so if we can reduce our presentations to six minutes per speaker, uh, that would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, our first speaker is somebody I know well uh, from uh, going back many years in Ottawa to uh, foreign affairs, Neil Reeder, who is now Vice President, Government Relations, uh, B2 Gold Corp. And uh, you have heard several mentions already this morning to uh, B2 Gold. Uh, so let me turn it over to Neil. Uh, thanks, John. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you, yes, and I can see your slide. Thank you. And uh, yes, yeah, good to see you again. Uh, let me start just by thanking Serba for your, your determined work to bring all this together. We're very happy to be a part of your discussions today. And of course, B2 Gold, and formerly as Bima Gold, was one of the early supporters of Serba. And we're very happy to see you prosper today. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> This is just a cautionary statement. We call this the page for the lawyers. It advises this presentation <laughs> may contain certain forward-looking statements. Next slide. So very quickly, the world according to B2 Gold, uh, Vancouver-based gold producer. We have uh, annual production of about 1 million ounces. We have three operating mines in West Africa, in Mali, in Southern Africa, in Namibia, and in the Philippines, the island of Masbate in the central Philippines. So combined production of about 1 million ounces, as I was saying. 
We also have two important development projects in Colombia, the Gran Malote project, which is a joint venture with Anglo Gold Ashanti. That uh, decision will be taken on that mine uh, sometime in the, later in the first quarter of this year. Very interesting potential. Another important uh, development project in Burkina Faso, south of the capital city, which may in fact uh, be a, another possibility for us to consider. And then exploration, I'll come to that, but Finland and Uzbekistan are some of the main areas. Uh, next slide. So this is just to talk about political risk and some of the principles that we have. On the right side of the screen, you'll see uh, the principles that guide the work of B2 Gold Abroad. We're Canada-based, but we're an international miner. And as you can see from the flags, in terms of BEMA Gold and B2, we have worked and built mines and acquired mines in a variety of countries, starting back in 1988 in Chile. Our most recent mine is the Focola mine, which we built within three years uh, on, on budget and under the timeline expected uh, in Mali. So these are values that we talk about as Canadian values, they're B2 values. And we, of course, as a proudly Canadian company, project those values abroad. I would mention the last bullet on the right is important, a commitment to local employment and training. Over 95% of all our staff at all our mines are local. We make every effort to empower, to train and build capacity for local employees. And we hope that we can continually expand the presence of local nationals at our mines and diminish the number of expatriates. We also place a great emphasis on training and capacity building both for our staff, but also for the local communities. Uh, next slide. This is a new slide. I'm very happy with this one. It just shows you a commitment to sustainability. Here we have four different international awards that B2 Gold has won in the past three months. On the left, we've just been advised we will receive the PDAC Sustainability Award for 2021. This will be presented at the forthcoming PDAC virtual meeting taking place in March. From the Mining Journal, a very prestigious mining publication, just before Christmas, we were awarded the most sustainable miner award uh, for 2020. The third award is from the government of Mali. This was presented to B2 Gold as the most responsible social enterprise uh, in the private sector in the country. This is the first time that a mining company in Mali has ever won this award. And the final award, the Gran Minera Award from the government of Antioquia province in Colombia. Again, interesting that we were recognized for community engagement, community programming in our work in assisting communities deal with the COVID impact. And all this was done voluntarily, of course, by B2 Gold, even before we started mine construction. And just as in Burkina Faso, we're a company that's committed to assisting communities well before decisions are taken on a mine construction. Next slide. I just wanted to mention some experience in Russia. I believe this is always important given Uzbekistan's strong traditional links to Russia. So as a company, our predecessor company, Bima Gold, had a long history of operating successfully in Russia. We built, for example, the Julieta underground mine in the Magadan region in the year 2000. Very difficult times, complex times in Russia, but also gold was $200 an ounce in those days. Bima Gold was nearly completing its much larger cupel mine when our company was acquired by Kinross in 2007. And at that point, the Bima executives went off to set up B2 Gold as a successor company. Throughout this period, we maintained very good relations with the Russian authorities, our joint venture partners, and of course, with the local communities, building mines in some of the most challenging natural environments in the world. Next slide. 
So now turning to Uzbekistan, and let me first of all thank Azam for his intervention on behalf of Goscom Geology. We're very pleased to work with him, with the staff from uh, Goscom Geology. They've been very supportive of our investment and exploration project in Uzbekistan, as we are one of the first foreign miners undertaking exploration in the country. We see great potential in the country. Obviously, Uzbekistan has a very strong record of major deposits. And of course, with the major economic reforms that are ongoing, moving towards a market economy, we see great potential, not only in the mining sector, but across other sectors as well. And we thank the government of Uzbekistan for the courage and the initiative to move forward with those reforms and welcoming foreign investment. Next slide. So here we're just talking about some of our ongoing exploration. Obviously, Burkina Faso, Finland, and Japan. And in Uzbekistan, now we've got a photo on the left of some early drilling. We have three licenses for exploration in the Navoy region. These aren't far from the Murantau mine, which is you know, considered to be the largest gold mine in the world. Some two to three million ounces of gold in annual production, which is remarkable. So we've identified a number of targets in that region through auger drilling, and we're very excited by some of the early results. We spent 4.5 million so far over two seasons on drilling, and some 38 people are permanently employed with us or under contract, obviously very early, early stages. Uh, next slide, please. So a second image of the drilling program in Uzbekistan, some 4,000 holes have been drilled. And we've discovered, as you'll see in the second bullet, a large anomaly similar to what we find in Murantau that has been identified. And this is giving us con considerable optimism going forward. We're optimistic about the future of the program. And we genuinely hope that we can discover significant deposits which would allow us to build a world class, a gla class gold mine in Uzbekistan and share our knowledge and uh, deep understanding of the sector with the government and people of Uzbekistan. I should also Neil, mention, could sum up. Yeah, I should also mention uh, that we have had issues with COVID, but we've had issues back and forth to the site and getting some uh, services and equipment into the country, but we have managed so far. A final slide uh, next, please. Just to say that we're well positioned for further investment. We've indicated to the government of Uzbekistan, if we are provided with advanced new projects, we will consider further investment opportunities on a larger scale. And our hope is to share our long international experience in various jurisdictions with our Uzbek friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Um, our second speaker in panel two is Christopher uh, Chagrel, director and member of the board of Schneider Group. Uh, I note that Christopher has lived in Moscow for 13 years and therefore has uh, good experience in, in both uh, Russia, but also certainly uh, elsewhere in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So Christopher. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Good morning and good evening uh, from, from Moscow. Uh, I will try to be very brief today, as actually we already have heard a lot. For us at Schneider Group, uh, Greater Eurasia is one of the, or is the main geographical area where we are working, it means that we support Western companies to start and enter to operate in Eurasia. Uh, coming to the topic for today, the opportunities in the Greater Eurasia Mets industry. We will take a look on some Eurasian countries. Uh, a lot we have already heard about Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, but a little bit of information will be about Ukraine. So can we uh, go to the next slide, please? Here, uh, just to do a very, very brief focus uh, on what we see uh, among, the, among the countries. Uh, uh, in general, a lot of equipment and material assets are outdated and need 
update and renewal for more efficient equipment. So this is mainly the main uh, business areas for international med suppliers uh, for equipment and services in the mining industry, which we see. What we usually see as a hindrance, well, besides the closed borders currently, uh, that the locations of mine and reserves are very remotely in the harsh weather conditions is also often a problem, which is not making our life easier here. Just one point here about the World Bank's ease of doing business, if we compare this a little bit, because we often see that companies say that it's, it is difficult to enter and operate in Eurasia. But if we compare the uh, review from the World Bank, World Bank, we see that, for example, Russia is placed 28 um, out of 190 economies, which is already 100 ranks better than it was 10 years ago. Uh, Canada is rated, for example, 23. Uh, Kazakhstan 25. So these countries are kind of neighbors in this respect. Uh, but let's not spend too much time here. Let's go to the next slide, please. Also here, we have already heard a lot about the, uh, the resources, what the countries have, maybe just very, very minor points. Mining is for Russia very important in the economy. It's generated about 11% of the country's GDP. For Kazakhstan, it is also about 13% of the GDP. So uh, the difference is maybe that Kazakhstan has a huge range of minerals. Uh, we know that from 105 elements of the periodic table, 99 are found in Kazakhstan, 70 have explored reserves, and more than 60 are in production. Ukraine is more focused on the extraction of coal and iron ore, and there are more than 20,000 deposits there. Uzbekistan, we heard it already a few minutes ago, is, is also for us very interesting as the country is opening, which, is, which means that also there's a lot of opportunities, not only in the mining industry, but in general, because a lot of investment come into new equipment, the update of uh, equipment, and all what concerns efficiency increases very, very much from demand there. Uh, maybe to the next slide, not to spend too much time here. Well, what I, we heard today and also what we uh, already spoke about, this forms the basis for the opportunities for foreign investors and suppliers, uh, especially of equipment and services. As the equipment is outdated, needs renew, need renewal, there is a shift from the manual to the mechanical labor and also to automatization. This means that digitalization is certainly also a future key area. Just an example. Uh, Russia imports currently 50% of bulldozers, 60% of loaders, or half of the drilling equipment. Hydraulic equipment, for example, is imported uh, by 95%. So these are areas where predominantly uh, support, uh, which is supported by foreign suppliers, uh, for example, also lifting ma machines or cranes. Kazakhstan's hard mineral sector suffers from the lack of new exploration activity in the past, because a lot of mines have been operating for decades. Uh, on the other hand, gold mining in particular has seen an impressive growth over the past years, as foreign companies have made huge investments in the country's top mines. We already heard a little bit of it today. Ukraine, uh, not touched today, has also a good general infrastructure, which is unfortunately often outdated and lacks investments. Work hazards and work-related accidents, uh, well, has also a high potential for foreign suppliers bringing uh, and uh, well, making a demand for safety equipment and digital solutions uh, to ensure the people better. Uzbekistan government is starting the privatization of the state-owned assets to increase the competition and make the market entry for private corporations more attractive and more easy. So this we've seen as a very, very positive trend from our side. Also, Uzbekistan plans to upgrade the processing equipment and to decrease the amount of obsolete equipment from 49 to 13% and to increase in the overall amount of the equipment in use. So as we are very limited in uh, time today, uh, we also go to the next slide and just say what uh, we are also supporting our MEDS companies with in all these countries, and actually it is eight countries with 11 offices and 500 employees. So we support uh, companies for the research to enter the country, efficiently operating there with all back office services and uh, information which is required there. We've prepared a 
profound mining report, and I'm happy to share it with you with uh, via server uh, in case this is interesting for you after the presentation. So thank you for the attention today. Christopher, thank you very much for a, a very concise and, and, and focused report. Yeah. Um, our next speaker in panel two is Constantin Barabash, uh, head of international sales uh, at Viking Air. And I know that Viking Air has a very active uh, program. So um, uh, over to you, Constantin. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good day to those on the other side of the world. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to connect with us today. My presentation, I'm going to try and keep very short because uh, all the details will most likely be taken offline. And I will take any kind of questions, of course, after that. Um, as mentioned uh, by John, my name is Constantine. I'm the Director of International Sales at Viking Air Limited. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Viking Air Limited is part of a group of companies. Uh, we are held by Longview Aviation Capital. Viking Air has been around for about 50 years. And uh, in the last 10 years, we have grown significantly. And we now include the de Havilland uh, of Canada company, Pacific Sky, which takes care of our um, training for all of the pilots and technicians. Longview Aviation Asset Management, uh, this company takes care of our um, leasing of aircraft and the Longview Aviation Services, which is currently involved in uh, currently involved in getting uh, putting together the new CL four fifteen aircraft, which I will speak to very shortly. Um, next slide, please. Uh, currently, Viking, together with all the other organizations in our group, hold type certificates for over 20 aircraft. Um, and we support all of these aircraft all around the world. That is our basically main business. Out of the 20 different types of aircraft, as you can see, we have um, different sizes of aircraft, different missions, uh, including firefighting. Uh, currently out of these, we manufacture and build three. Next slide, please. Uh, this one might look familiar to you. This is the former Bombardier Q400 aircraft, which has joined our uh, group of companies approximately a year and a half ago. So it used to be the Q400. Now we're calling the, the, the Havilland Dash 8. Basically now uh, Viking Air uh, and Longview Aviation holds all of the de Havilland uh, type certificates. So they're all back under one roof, which is great. Next slide, please. This is the new four CL-415 Enhanced Aerial Firefighter. This is an aircraft that we have been uh, in the works of for a few years. Uh, first one was delivered in 2020. It already participated in the firefighting season in the US uh, this past summer, as a matter of fact. So that's working out great. Uh, next slide, please. And the Twin Otter. Um, I'm sure many people have heard about the Twin Otter, and this is the aircraft I'm going to focus a little bit more about uh, on uh, for the next few slides. Uh, it's our most versatile platform, which can do a whole lot of different things uh, for many different sectors in the business <clears throat> world and in the, in the business of carrying passengers. Next slide. Um, of course, first and foremost, it's a regional commuter. Uh, it carries 19 passengers, can easily be converted into a cargo aircraft to carry two tons of cargo. Um, and of course, what's important to note is that it can go pretty much anywhere. In the picture here, you can see two aircraft sitting on a beach, as a matter of fact. And this is in Scotland, where they take off in the water, still on wheels. <laughs> so connecting remote regions and going to places where no other aircraft go is what we do and what we specialize in. Uh, so basically connecting remote communities, connecting work sites, taking workers to their sites, uh, as well as supporting scientific exploration in the most remote regions of the world is what we do, right? And uh, Kupal, for example, in Chukotka, uh, there's a Dash 8 that flies there um, with Aurora, I believe. 
and the twin order would do the job as well. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see, uh, industrial support is something that our aircraft does on a daily basis. We have many companies around the world um, carrying their cargo and their passengers, their workers to their work sites um, in oil and gas, as well as in, in mining. Uh, next slide, please. Next thing of interest uh, pertaining to our conference here is geophysical exploration. Uh, our aircraft can be equipped to do geophysical exploration. Uh, all kinds of equipment can be installed. Uh, it's very simple to do. Uh, and uh, almost any aircraft can be equipped with um, magnetometers, LIDARs, VIDARs, you name it. Uh, next slide, please. Support in remote regions, like I said, it's what we do. Um, if there is limited uh, transportation, uh, not a lot of ways to get in and out of a place, a twin otter would definitely do the job. You can see here it landed on a frozen lake. We can land pretty much anywhere. Next slide, please. One of the other options, we're connecting islands, uh, flying on floats. Many of you probably have seen the aircraft in Vancouver and in Victoria. Uh, there are many float planes flying between the island and uh, Vancouver. Uh, here you can see in the Maldives, Maldives, we have one of the largest fleets in the world on floats in the Maldives, as well as Seychelles. It's been a great success. It's uh, provided access to all of those different islands for tourists and for locals alike. Uh, next slide, please. Is that it? I have more. <laughs> That's the wrong presentation. <laughs> but uh, to finalize, that was six minutes. Um, like I said, we will take you anywhere you need to go, land on anything you need. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Constantine. And that was, yes, very concise and, and uh, very relevant. Um, our fourth speaker in panel two is Mr. Dava Ochir. Uh, Managing Director of Mining and Heavy Industries at the Max Group uh, in Mongolia. Um, I note that he's got 17 years uh, experience in geological exploration. Um, and um, let me turn it over to Mr. Dava Ochir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John. And thank you, Serpa. Good morning in Canada and good evening from the Eurasia. So, uh, saving the time, I prepared the video presentation. Just please share with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving us an opportunity to present our project to you. My name is Inkpayo Paturik. I'm the project manager at Halta Resource. I will do the quick introduction about our project within five minutes. First of all, I would like to highlight here that we're concerned about safety before we take any action on our project. Safety is our priority. Moving on to the company, Health Terra Resource is a related company of Max Group, one of the leading group companies in Mongolia, which operates in various business industries. As for the Health Terra Resource, the company has been established in 2019 for the purpose of developing the gold project. In 2018, with the reconnaissance geological exploration, the geologist engineers at Max Mining have discovered the gold deposit with its initial 10 drill holes. Upon the discovery, the company appointed SRK Consulting to perform technical review on the completed exploration data, which they have provided standard operating procedures for our exploration, according to JORC guidelines. In 2019, we have completed a total of 17,000 meter drill works and other related studies on our deposit. In March 2020, based on our 2019 exploration data, SRK Consulting has estimated the deposit resource at 37 million tons of ore containing 41 tons of gold, and the mining license has been issued. As of today, the geological exploration is still ongoing. The project area locates in Gobialte province, Western Mongolia, 1,000 km to the west from Ulaanbaatar city, which is about two hours of flight. The exp 
Exploration updates as of today are shown here. We have drilled about 52,000 meters for 190 drill holes. The average depth range is between 250 to 300 meters. And other fundamental studies for the project is being carried out at the project site. From the geology map shown here, you can see the potential mineralization zone shown in yellow, which covers about 1,000 hectare area. Shown in red is the alteration zone and the purple zone shows the drill verified gold mineralization zone. Interestingly, only 20% of the mineralization zone was drilled as of May this year. As of today, the drill area covers up to 40% of the total mineralization zone. Here's the saddle image shows that the mineralization zone length, which could reach up to 5.5 kilometers. I would like to highlight here is the rhombotic copper deposit shown here in purple, which is only about six kilometers south from the gold deposit. Its resource is estimated at 26 million tons of ore that contains 140,000 tons of copper. And the average copper, average copper content is around 0.5%. Here is the resource table of our gold project provided by SRK Consulting based on our 2019 exploration data. The total resource is estimated at 41.5 tons of gold contained in 37 million tons of ore at the average gold grade of 1.12 gram per ton. The ore body model based on the average grade in three categories for example, shown in pink are the sections that have the gold grade more than 0.92 gram per ton. By the type of ore, the ore body is modeled as shown as in orange are the 8 million tons of oxide ore, whereas the yellow is for 29 tons of primary ore. Right after the discovery, we have wasted no time sending ore samples to the various international laboratories for the metallurgical test works. The metal recovery was 72% on the oxide ore leaching test work and 96% on the flotation and oxidation test work on primary ore. Based on the ore types, we are planning our, our project development in two phases. Phase one for the development of oxide ore processing, which we are planning the heat leaching operation by late 2021. Currently all facilities are on the engineering stage. Phase two for primary ore processing. Other than our gold project, Max Group has several other ongoing projects in Western Mongolia, including copper mining project, wind power generation project, and coal mining projects. For more information, please contact us with the following detail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you share the next one slide? Oh. I want to update the current uh, status of the exploration work. And uh, right now we have the, uh, uh, this next slide. Oh, I can, I can share from my computer if you wish because it's uh, too long to uh, yes please do oh thank you uh, uh, okay uh we have uh, right now uh, in 2020 we drilled up to the almost 200 drill holes and also increase the resource numbers. As shown now, we have uh, more than 1 million tons of ore in total in proven in drilling. And the uh, average grade is uh, above the one gram ton. So this is the our uh, our bodies cross sections and shown in the highest grade is the red color and the, the above uh, one grand ton grades are the green and the pink. So in our gold project is uh, still developing and still we are unknown about the extension of our bodies and the reserves. 
So it's maybe the biggest gold uh, deposit in Mongolia currently. In next one, two years, we uh, very actively exploring more uh, exploration work. And this year, 2021, we uh, need to start the first mining stage on the oxidation zone, which is the technology of the hip leaching. So uh, about this project, we uh, need to the demand of the infrastructure, for example, the electricity uh, supply, then that's why we are studying about the feasibility study of the uh, wind farm and the coal burning power plants. Mm -hmm. So thank you for uh, hearing me and thank you, Serba, to giving this opportunity to present our project in here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davoch here, both for the um, presentation on the gold project and for your update. Uh, mm -hmm. Our final speaker for panel two, and where we're almost on time, is uh, Deliara uh, Technigulova of Kazakh uh, Invest uh, National Company. Um, uh, she is a project director specializing in investment projects uh, of mining and metallurgical industry. She is in charge for assisting foreign investors at all stages of project implementation. Giliara, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, uh, I would like to give uh, some more insight on prospects of mining and metallurgical industry of Kazakhstan. Uh, I represent investment promotion agency, Kazakh Invest, which was established by the government of Kazakhstan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, next slide. Uh, for Kazakhstan, the mining and metallurgical industry plays a strategic role. Overall, Kazakhstan ranks world six for uh, natural resources and 10th for the total volume of minerals, excluding oil and gas. Uh, in terms of variety of uh, natural uh, resources, Kazakhstan is also distinguished by its leading position uh, in the world. So like 99 elements uh, are identified in subsoil of Kazakhstan, 70 of them are explored and 60 are being extracted today. Next slide, please. In general, we believe that uh, prospects uh, and opportunities of mining and metallurgical industry in Kazakhstan are related to the following. First is the exploration of new prospective areas that have not been explored before or explored to a limited extent. In this regard, uh, an important initiative of Kazakhstan was adoption of new mining code uh, that opens up myriad opportunities for industry players. Uh, second is the development of deposits for which uh, exploration and mining licenses have been already allocated, so-called secondary market. In this regard, uh, Kazakh Invest uh, cooperates uh, with private Kazakhstani companies, and we have a pipeline of promising uh, projects of private subsoil users to offer potential investors. Uh, next is the application of new uh, efficient methods for ore processing and metal producing to the previously uh, explored deposits in order to increase their productivity and reach economic feasibility. Uh, in this regard, we welcome Canadian and other foreign investors with rich expertise uh, to, uh, in order to participate in the development of uh, deposits and uh, to process uh, traditionally extracted uh, ores. And uh, last but not the least is the development of further conversion uh, of metal processing. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, Kazakhstan uh, adopted new mining code, uh, uh, code on subsoil and subsoil use. Uh, important conceptual innovations, I would mention that uh, we, uh, our new code uh, totally corresponds to the world best practice. It introduces Australian model in mining sector. Uh, and we, um, our mining code uh, includes a principle of first come first served principle, open access to geological information, 
and uh, in, importantly, uh, it enhances functioning of junior mining companies and possibility of raising uh, capital. Next slide, please. Uh, with the purpose of uh, attracting foreign investors effectively, Kazakh Invest uh, closely cooperates with uh, international consultants before. We have identified uh, more than 40 projects, promising projects uh, in uh, various um, uh, metals. And our aim is to match these investment opportunities with suitable uh, foreign investors. Uh, our teasers on all these uh, investment uh, projects are available on our website. Uh, and uh, if there is any interest from uh, foreign investors, potential foreign investors, we will gladly provide uh, more detailed information. Uh, uh, next slide, please. In general, uh, as I mentioned, we have investment opportunities in base metals, precious metals, iron ore, rare and rare earth metals. But here I'd like to draw your attention on availability of energy metals in Kazakhstan. Uh, with the in, uh, high increase uh, in the uh, demand for iron, uh, lithium iron batteries, we believe that investors, potential investors should have a closer look to uh, lithium uh, projects that we have in our pipeline. Uh, several uh, private Kazakhstani companies obtained licenses for rock lithium deposits uh, and started their exploration works. Uh, in fact, full research to establish uh, the exact lithium uh, reserves in Kazakhstan has not yet been performed. That's why uh, we have uh, open uh, opportunities uh, for uh, potential foreign investors. Uh, we also have, uh, Kazakhstan is also rich for uh, nickel, up to 10% of world reserves is concentrated in Kazakhstan. Some of nickel deposits have uh, cobalt uh, in the ratio favorable for feasible extraction. Uh, in this regard, uh, we also welcome potential investors interested in nickel and cobalt deposits. Uh, in general, uh, the content of nickel ranges between 0.7 to 1%, 2%. And uh, vanadium uh, is also an impo important metal uh, today. Uh, we have, Kazakhstan has significant uh, deposits of vanadium and already has some uh, refining facilities. Further increase uh, is connected to the development of uh, deposits uh, with unconventional ore composition. Uh, and these uh, major deposits actually can be in the future uh, supplemented with um, uh, battery projects as well, Redex batteries. Uh, next slide, please. So today, the main uh, strategic uh, task of Kazakhstan is to maximize the processing of uh, raw materials within the country. Having said that, uh, ferrous and non-ferrous metallurgy are identified as priority sectors in Kazakhstan. Uh, we provide the potential investors with uh, a number of uh, tax, uh, a number of investment incentives, including uh, tax. Uh, uh, holidays, exemption from customs duties, uh, simplified procedure for attracting foreign labor, uh, investment subsidies, and others. As you can see, we uh, investment preferences in special economic zones and other regions are pretty much the same. Uh, although the first ones are specified in specific um, sector each in uh, special economic zones. So yeah, these were the uh, overall, uh, the development of mining and metallurgical industry is facilitated by a favorable investment uh, climate in Kazakhstan. The government of Kazakhstan uh, supports your uh, investment intentions uh, and we are here ready to help to start your business in Kazakhstan. And if you have any questions, please uh, ask, I'll be happy to assist. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Diliar. And I note that we are, are just about right on, on time again. So um, thank you to all the panelists in our panel too for being uh, as precise and concise as possible. Um, I note that we have uh, uh, two questions, uh, one related to Mongolia, which has been answered separately. 
uh, by the uh, um, uh, Embassy of Mongolia uh, to Canada, and one that was um, uh, uh, directed to Mr. Satiev of Kazakhstan. And perhaps, Dilyara, if you might want to respond to this, um, how could uh, Canadian companies approach the Kazakh government to apply for uh, contracts from the government? I know that you've responded um, in writing, but if you might want to say a word or two about uh, what um, uh, the uh, plans of the Kazakh government are, um, I'll give you a couple of minutes before we go to closing remarks. Uh, Dilyara, you are uh, muted. Yeah can, uh, yeah. yeah, can you hear me now? I can, we can hear you. Can't see you, but we can hear you. Uh, okay. There we go. Yes, uh, unfortunately, Talgat Satif had to leave uh, because he got an important uh, call. Uh, I'd like to just add uh, to his comment that uh, actually Kazakhs, uh, the uh, pr uh, government of Kazakhstan allocates in the upcoming five years uh, uh, a huge amount of money for the exploration works. And for those companies who want to participate in this program, I believe uh, that uh, uh, it's important to uh, maybe cooperate with the local companies uh, because uh, an important requirement is that uh, it should be a Kazakhstani registered company to be able to participate in this program. And one of the options would be uh, cooperating with national company Kaz Geology. And uh, for the information, I believe we can additionally sent uh, via email. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who has hung in for the last two hours. Um, uh, it's been a, 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 a session with an awful lot of information, but I think people know how to uh, uh, follow up. Um, and before turning it over to Gilles Breton for some closing remarks, I would like to thank Tatiana and all the members of CERBA who have organize this very informative session. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Gilles for uh, closing remarks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Sloan. Uh, I've, that's the first thing I have to do, of course, is thank you very, very much for your work today at this ungodly hour in British Columbia. <laughs> It is that's ungodly true. in Vancouver, or it is yeah, in British right. Columbia. So, but I, I think we have got on our side. So thank you to participants, sponsors, and especially, as you just said, to the organizer of this event, the main organizer of this event, Tatiana, in Vancouver. Of course, AME Online is replacing one of the most important mining discussions we normally have in Canada at this time of the year. I, I, as you said, we have a very good conversation that covered a lot of topics about mining in general. I think also the, we have to bear in mind that this is all intended to try to support trade and investment. Uh, I would also venture to comment that, of course, if, you're, if your grandparents were alive today, they might not be called mining engineers. They might be called environmental engineers <laughs> in the sense that the, the shift, of course, has been from, from mining to, to so, you know, mining in mining, the mining sector to sustainable development and clean technology. And I think we at Servo look at this as the, these two sorry, words, uh, teams driving our expansion of our activity in this area, sustainable development and clean technology. I would also like to observe, uh, and it was alluded to at some point today, that of course, throughout the pandemic, the mining sector was one of the best positioned because of course of its own practices in terms of safety, security and whatnot. The mining sector was well, uh, how to say, uh, positioned to, to sort of continue work also extremely well positioned now to boost recovery. So I think that's very relevant to our discussion that I think we can see that you know, uh, the old image of the mining sector has, has, has been completely transformed to, uh, to something that is quite remarkable. I think some, many speakers have mentioned that, including our friend Neil Reeder, that the mining is, is a totally different industry than it used to be. So in that respect, I think we, we can look forward to uh, the, the positive uh, impact of mining industry on the whole economy and our re economic recovery in the next few months. Um, this being said though, of course, uh, one of the points I wanted to make absolutely, of course, normally uh, uh, in a normal environment, we would have now a cocktail hour, one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions and so on and so forth. So I think it's very important for participants to bear in mind that of course, since we could not have one-on-one -on -one conversations, they should be very uh, diligent perhaps in sending a message to their 
uh, serve a regional director or to Tatiana directly about uh, you know how to continue this conversation. I think it's very important that we 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 engineer the follow up. Uh, the online discussion is is different, but of course online follow up is very important. So I, I would encourage you to to send us a message, even if you say that you you what you liked or didn't like about this event. So thank you very much to all again. Looking forward to seeing you at our next online events. There are a few ones coming up on the line, including one, uh, the PDAC event in Toronto in March. And I think uh, on this, I would like to so perhaps uh, give the word back to our to our master in these circumstances, Tatiana, if you want to say a few words in closing. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, or th thank you, thank you, Jill. Um, and uh, um, again, I would like uh, to thank everyone who uh, took their time and uh, uh, sustained the two hours of uh, our event today. And uh, I think it was uh, quite interesting and unusual session. Um, although uh, probably I would not wish our uh, anniversary event to be online, I would uh, be happier to uh, raise now glasses of champagne uh, all together. But I hope uh, this is a good beginning of the uh, continuation of the new era of uh, communications. And I hope that it will bring some positive results. So again, I would uh, uh, reiterate what uh, uh, Jill and John uh, and the other speakers just said. Uh, come in touch with us. We are prepared. We're here to help you facilitate new business connections and uh, develop uh, Canadian uh, exposure in uh, Eurasian uh, resource sector. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, our um, I see a couple of uh, questions. Just appearing. Okay, it's just it's uh, right. just uh, the the uh, uh, brief comments. Um, thank you, and uh, I think we we can now be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.